the Supreme Court is considering affirmative action, the policy that aims to counter discrimination in college application processes and provide opportunities to underrepresented groups. Justices took up the issue after challenges at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. Lower courts previously upheld the policy. They ruled the schools did not discriminate against white and Asian students. The high court's ruling is expected by the end of June, but as there is a conservative majority, many experts are expecting them to throw this policy out. Kentashi is a higher education fellow with the group Campus Reform, which is a conservative watchdog group on the nation's higher education system, also an attorney. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Oh, Chris, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, and how has affirmative action, it's been in place for decades, had an impact on higher education? Well, the impact initially was about 20 years ago when the court uh, indicated that race could be considered a factor in admissions. Um, the challenge has been that over the years that's morphed into a process where race has become, in many cases, determinative of uh, admission decisions, which was never contemplated by the court. So that really is the issue before the court right now as to whether it's going to allow race to be continue to be used or whether it's going to uh, determine that uh, it's, it has strayed significantly from what was originally intended by the court and strike it down. So if the Supreme Court were to strike down affirmative action, a ruling is expected sometime this month, uh, many schools say they rely on it to make sure that their incoming classes are racially diverse. What impact would that have on diversity in schools? Sure. Well, this is one area that we really don't have to speculate because there are currently nine states that have outlawed the use of race in admissions, one as far back as 1996. And those states include, among others, California, Michigan, Oklahoma. Uh, and all of those states continue to boast uh, broad diversity rates as well as maintain their academic competitiveness. Uh, in fact, back in 2021, University of California boasted its most diverse class admitted ever. Uh, similarly, in that year, the University of Michigan indicated exponentially increased uh, rates of admission of blacks and Hispanics over prior years. Uh, they're going to get there, though, by not using race or focusing on race as a factor in admissions. They're going to, however, use non-racial or race neutral factors the very same factors that many of these institutions in the nine states are currently using and uh, have been effective in achieving not only racial diversity but a much broader base of diversity um, which is frankly more important uh, in higher education than just simply and exclusively fixating on uh, a racial classification that's checked on an application but you do have the University of Michigan, which last year filed a brief uh, in connection uh, to this case with the Supreme Court, which said, and uh, as you were saying, Michigan uh, no longer allows affirmative action since 2006. Uh, and the University of Public Schools said that it's been more difficult to get uh, racially diverse classes. What do you say to those schools who say that they, they really do just rely on at least knowing which candidates, what their races may be as, as they look to uh, make sure that they do have diversity on campus? Sure. Well, if you're if you're using race as a uh, a factor to uh, separate or classify students, all in the effort to achieve a racially proportionate student body, uh, which is what many institutions are using race to do these days, you're engaging in nothing more than racial balancing, and that amounts to a racial quota. Both are illegal under federal law. So, while Michigan uh, may say and indicate it's it's a more of a challenge if they cannot use race to achieve. Uh, student body diversity, those things can be achieved uh, as they are in, in many other states using race neutral factors like focusing on socioeconomic diversity or geographic diversity or uh, experiential diversity or ideological Logical diversity. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to expand ideological diversity in our campuses? Um, we don't have much of that in the faculty. We don't have much of that uh, by way of students these days. So um, we really want to look to create a much broader base of diversity and not just base that, uh, that definition of diversity solely exclusively on racial classification. In a lot of ways, it's, it's the height of, uh, of arrogance for college administrators to think that they can predict the views and perspectives 
of say underrepresented applica- uh, applicants based solely exclusively on uh, on their skin color. Uh, skin color is not a predictor or a proxy for uh, life experience, and we need to get away from that and start focusing more on a much broader base of diversity that will, will really contribute to the educational environment. If the Supreme Court uh, decides to strike down affirmative action, in this case related to academics, uh, affirmative action also is something in the workplace. Is that what the Supreme Court could look to next? Uh, there's a possibility. I mean, higher education is one of those areas where uh, it is permissible to use race as a factor uh, a- among many others when considering uh, an applicant. Um, that's d- distinct and different from the employment setting, generally where race um, is not a factor or cannot be a determining factor in the hiring process. Um, so, you know, it, it, it will not directly impact on the employment setting, but it may indeed be persuasive on uh, on future rulings in the employment setting. Our Ken Tashi, a campus uh, reform education fellow and attorney. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for your insight tonight.